let me introduce Becky Duval Reese, who will then s introduce our other speakers. Um, Becky was my co-curator for this exhibition, and it was just a tremendous joy to work with you, Becky. Um, she really ramped up our game here at the Whitliff in all sorts of ways that you guys won't notice, but the curators all know. And every time Becky would come in this space, we would all kind of grab her and say, what do you think about this idea? Or what do you think about this idea? Becky's a pro. Uh, and the reason she's a pro is because she served as director of the El Paso Museum from 1991 to 2005, that is a very long time, where she oversaw the completion of a new uh, 104,000 square foot building and brought it uh, much deserved national recognition, um, not only for the building, but for the strengths of its programs and collections. Uh, and then just picking out a couple other highlights from her uh, career. Um, she was educational curator, assistant director, and then interim director of the, and this is a flashback for y'all, the Archer M. Huntington Art Gallery at the University of Texas at Austin, now known as the Blanton Museum of Art. Um, she has served uh, on the Texas Association of Museums Council, been the past president of the Texas Fine Arts Association. Becky's a real expert in the field of Texas art and has published numerous articles, essays, exhibition catalogs, which I love. Uh, most recently, and I, I should have grabbed it, we have it for sale in the store, this newly revamped store. You can buy this book that I'm about to mention, Another World, The Art of David Everett. You see how this is all coming around. Uh, published in uh, 2021, it's a beautiful, wonderful book. Um, Becky is passionate about education and learning. I like that distinction. Uh, and was a board member of UTEP's Lifelong Learning Institute and now very much involved with Lifelong Learning here in San Marcos, where she is the Associate Director of Lifelong Learning. She has, uh, most importantly for us here at the Whitliff, she has served on the Advisory Council here at the Whitliff since 2017. Please give it up for Becky Duval Reese. <laughs> so good to see you all here, and I am so happy to, be, to have been a part of this, and I just have a few remarks to make, and then we're going to start a, a really short 15, 20-minute panel a conversation with Ann Matlock and Mary Bones. But I want to thank David and uh, thank all of the staff involved in putting this exhibition together. There were many hands and minds involved in this endeavor, and I am grateful for the experience of working with all of the staff here. Many of us here today count ourselves friends of Jim. Many contributed to the designated Whitliff Fund that provided the purchase of 41 new works augmented by Jim's gift of eight. The Whitliff now becomes the prime repository for the art of Jim Bones with 280 photographs. Thank you to all who have made this possible and thank you to the Whitliff Collections for ensuring the legacy of this important photographer. I had the pleasure of working with Jim on this show. We communicated often by keeping him informed as decisions were made all of last year. He liked the title. He approved having his picture enlarged for the entrance, even though that took a lot of prodding on my part. <laughs> and he was comfortable with the number of photographs that we would install. Jim printed all the new work. He packaged and sent the photographs in batches over the months and uh, shortly before his death, he finished the last batch. I'm so very glad that Jim knew about his exhibit and was, uh, was involved in so much of its development. <clears throat> I thought I wasn't gonna do that, okay. <laughs> A little background on Jim. He was born in Monroe, Louisiana, came to Texas to attend UT, and to study aerospace engineering, probably due to his father's influence as an officer in the Air Force. 
But Jim recounts there was a pivotal moment when he noticed a cone-shaped fossil and realized its shape mirrored nuclear warheads. He was struck by the idea that the fossil had survived thousands of years, while his current line of study produced technology that could destroy all of life in seconds. This epiphany led to his study of geology using photography as a tool. Yet another pivotal moment for Jim was when he was when renowned photographer Russell Lee saw his photographic work and asked him to be his teaching assistant. What had been a tool became an art. There is an early Whitliffe collection, connection to Jim's life as well. Jim met Bill and Sally Whitliffe in the late 1960s, and through their Encino Press, they published his first book, Texas Earth Surfaces from 1970. In the late 1970s, Bill and Sally, and again through their Encino Press, published two portfolios of Jim's photographs. They're in, on view in this gallery behind us. Bill and Sally's support was really important to Jim's early career. They supported his application uh, to be a fellow at Paisano, the J. Frank Doby uh, retreat that was Doby's former ranch. And um, Jim was the first photographer to be selected for the award. In the exhibit, there are photographs Jim made uh, while at Paisano, and they're on the wall here. Uh, and the glass case holds all the books that Jim published during his life. And the Texas Earth Service, Surfaces book Encino Press published is on view, and it's for sale in the museum store, <laughs> along with the magnet. <laughs> So uh, Bill Whitliffe, while Jim was at Pasano, Bill Whitliffe made photographs, black and white photographs of Jim while he was in residence. And so we put two of, the, of Bill Whitliffe's photographs in this gallery. And you will see Jim, and I hope I don't embarrass Reed, but uh, Bill uh, made a photograph of Jim with the young Reed Whitliffe on his shoulder. So, Maybe be sure and see the photograph and then embarrass Reed. <laughs> In some ways, it feels like Jim's involvement with uh, Bill and Sally has come full circle. <clears throat> but the sad part comes now when we view this exhibition without Jim's presence. You know, it's a lovely thing to remember and we're here to share our voices and memories and inaugurate this exhibition that honors our friend, the artist, Jim Bones. But be to begin our SHARP program, uh, Mary Bones and Matt Lock, and, my, Matt Lock <laughs> and I will talk together for about 10 or 15 minutes. And then um, there are gonna be staff in the gallery with microphones uh, and we'll have people with the microphone, and we want to encourage anyone who wants to speak about a memory or say something, we'll encourage that. Um, and it will follow uh, Robert Matloff. As soon as our panel's over, Robert Matloff, um, Robert Bones. <laughs> okay, I said this was gonna be informal, right? Okay. We are, we are related. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, Robert Bones, uh, Jim's brother, is going to make uh, a short comment, and then we'll open uh, for uh, questions or comments. Um, Anne Matlock is an internationally recognized textile artist. She is a master weaver, and her work is in numerous corporate, public, and private collections. Anne's career also includes having taught at Ohio University and Lamar University. In her art, she invented and developed weaving techniques that she in turn taught many. A weaver who also hand spun and had dyed, hand dyed the yards, yards, 
she often used and is both unique and respected in her field. Mary Bones is director of the Museum of the Big Ben in Alpine. In her 18-year tenure, she also served the museum as curator and educator. She is responsible for the recent expansion of the museum, a 10,000 square foot gallery event space designed by Larry Speck of Page Architects. It was an $11 million project which Mary achieved. It's a major accomplishment to fundraise for a capital project and to work with architects to bring out a building that is both handsome and functional. So we congratulate Mary on that and I think we're gonna to move to the stage. Thanks. All right, Anne and Mary. I'm gonna maybe start with Anne. And the first question is, how did you meet Jim? Uh, I met Jim because he was Russell Lee's assistant. And when Russ, first, the first year that Russ taught photography at UT, he recruited Jim. And uh, I decided to take the class. It was my, I believe it was my senior year. What year was that? It would be uh, 65, 66, that, that school year. Right. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, we, we soon, soon became close and later married in, in 67. So. Are you all hearing okay? Great. Yeah. Great, great. Okay. So, what happened next? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure what you want to know. <laughs> I'll leave that up to you. <laughs> yeah. uh, after graduation, I did, I did some teaching, and Jim pursued his photography and also did a fair amount of motion picture film work um, with uh, Ron Perryman, um, and then later, I mean, he, he was always doing his still photography, but he did get involved in some motion picture projects. The, for instance, the, the, the uh, Corporation for Public Broadcasting awarded him a fellowship to work through uh, KERA in Dallas to produce a series on nature. And I, the connection there was probably uh, A.C. Green, who is a writer that's probably in this collection, I would think, but, and Bill Porterfield. Uh, A.C. and Bill were part of the original newsroom at, at KERA right. that catapulted Jim Lair to bigger things. Um, right. So it, he did a very beautiful series. It was still, it's in the public broadcast lab library and gets played every so often when they're fundraising because it's so pretty. Right. Yeah. So. At, at what point did you all move to the land above the Pernalis River? Uh, we, we bought that land just before Jim's, Jim won the Paisano Fellowship, but we weren't living there. Uh, and then we moved there at the end of the fellowship time, so about 70 three, right. 72, 73. I think you told me at, at one point that <laughs> when you were there, it was just first a small cabin, right? Without water, without? Oh, oh it was worse than that. <laughs> um, it, it was <laughs> no, it, it was an old defunct van. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> dra dra dragged onto the property behind our Rambler American station wagon. <laughs> Not usually a vehicle you use for moving heavy objects. But, um, so, you know, and, and then we built onto that uh, with scrap lumber. I mean, it was sort of early days of, to, of an artist couple that were. You know, Talk about you know, pioneer life. I and mean. later, yeah, so we didn't have any. We had, but the, the creek was running. We had water in the creek, and we, we had uh, kerosene lamps, and we had a wood burning stove. Well, <laughs> Anne is, is so, still in this house, but now it has water. Well, it has not, electricity. Not, not that house. Not that <laughs> house? Oh, okay. We, we actually, Jim and I, put the foundation down and raised the wall okay. studs for the house I'm in now. 
I, I was just so impressed to realize that you had <laughs> such a rustic beginning. And very, very rustic, <laughs> Becky. <laughs> Did y'all also go down to like your grandparents' place and get like an old yes. chicken coop as well? No, we we took down some buildings on the old Beasley place. Okay, yeah, and that's what, those were our building Beasley materials. Place, yeah. So crazy. Okay, so it was it was uh, it was an adventure. It was ground up. Yeah. <laughs> So, so Anne and Jim were married for 12 years, right? No, we were married for eight. Eight, okay. We were probably together as a couple longer than that, but okay. we were officially married okay. for eight. All right. <laughs> yeah. So why don't we have Mary Bones talk a little bit about, I bet, how, where did you meet Jim? <laughs> oh, Jim at the... Before, before I talk about how I met Jim, I just want to, again, thank Anne and Becky for bringing this all fruition for Jim. I'd like to thank everyone here at the Whitliff and Sally in particular for bringing this collection here. And I'd also like to thank all the friends and family that came out today to celebrate Jim and his beautiful work. So how I met Jim, unbeknownst to us until he and I started talking about it, in 1984, I had had my first child, a little girl named Amelia. Is that better? And um, my husband then was working at Whole Earth Provision Company, and there was a big party. And I was like, oh, well, we have to go. Amelia was one year old. Nobody had seen her, and I was so excited, my little baby girl. And so we go, and it goes through the crowd, crowd. Oh, my God, Jim Bones is coming. And maybe Jim had just published a book, I'm not sure. But I knew he was a big deal. Oh my God. And I was just like, oh my God, celebrities coming in. I'm just going to power fade into the background. So that's 1984. Jim later on told me, yeah, I remember there was a lady there that evening with the, little, with the baby. I was like, well, that was me, buddy. So <laughs> fast forward. I'm working, I was hired at the Museum of the Big Bend. I started off as a collection manager, uh, probably around 2000, 2001. And shortly thereafter, my director came into my office and he said, um, there's a photographer that's coming by um, this afternoon. He would like to look at the W.D. Smithers collection. So big, big photographer had worked out in the Big Bend area, 30s and 40s. Uh, the Ransom Center purchased, I don't know, 10,000 of his images. But we also had uh, copies. And he said, this, this guy's coming over. He wants to look at the Smithers collection, and in particular, the quicksilver mining, the mercury mining that was happening in South County. And oh, by the way, his name is Jim Bones. And I froze, because once again, I was like, this is the real deal photographer. And where we had the Smithers collection was in a basement that had water dripping from the ceiling. And I was like, this man is going to be so horrified at what he is seeing. So I'm like, okay, okay, all right, I'm getting revved up. And at the time, my office door opened, and you could see right to the front door that led into our suite of offices. And Jim Bones walked through the door. It's never happened to me. I hope it happens to all of you at some point. But my heart just flew out of me when I saw him come in. And I was like, you're going to be my best friend. And I, it was, that was it. Poor Jim, he had no idea what was coming. <laughs> but I, it was like automatic, and we went downstairs, and Jim was so much fun, and he loved to talk. And I, Jim, he loved talking with everybody. And we get down there, and he's going through all the smithers, and he picks, I don't know, 20 of the images, and we go upstairs, and I'm just so goofy. I'm like, okay, ha, ha, take them. And he was like, well, no, you're a museum. I think I need, like, a loan form. I was like, uh. I, it, was, it was like high school. Oh, my God. And he drove a... Um, like a Dodge Ram or some Bronco, but there was an archaeologist that almost had the exam make, model, and color. And I would be in my office and I would see that Bronco and I'd be like, oh, it's Jim, it's Jim, it's Jim, it's Jim, it's Jim. And then it would leave and I'd be like, oh, he's gone. So that's how we met. And it was just, you are going to be my best friend. And we just had a wonderful life together. We really did. He was. 
amazing photograph photographer, but just talk about, I've never met anyone as smart as Jim, as thoughtful as he is. I cannot tell you how much he helped me out in my career. His advice and knowledge and guidance, oh my God, it was such a gift. And then he could just be the goofiest guy on the planet <laughs> on top of it. So that's yeah. how we met. Yeah. yeah. Lovely, lovely. I, I really like uh, that uh, David Coleman put this uh, quote up on the wall because I think, I know we talked earlier about uh, Jim's philosophy behind, behind his work. And I think in his own words, he tells us what these photographs are about. And in a way, in his own words, he challenges us to take care of this environment. Um, also, we all were struck, in all of uh, Jim's books, he writes essays. And Jim is a really good writer. And his books are, are beautiful to look at. But uh, especially in some of the earlier books when he was more into geology, I mean, you learn vocabulary, you know, like what's a fisher and what is a hoodoo. And, you know, it, yeah. the, he, he explains um, the, the, the earth. He explains the flowers in words, and then the beautiful photographs show us what he was writing about. So his books are really wonderful, uh, beautiful essays and, and his voice was really a beautiful voice. So now I'm really happy that quote is there. So it helps us focus even more on the kind of the quietness the, that I feel in looking at so many of these works. And I'm so happy the Wetliff has uh, now taken on the kind of protecting the legacy of, of this art but also uh, the legacy of Jim's reputation. And, and we know his treasures are here, so. Do you all have other things? I know we want, we want people in the audience to speak, but as you all were talking about how you met Jim, you know, in a way I feel like I sort of met him through marriage too. Not, yeah. not that I was married to Jim, but <laughs> I married one of his friends who was uh, in art school uh, with Jim in the mid-60s to uh, uh, Eric Anderson was my husband. He was an artist. And uh, Eric, I met Eric about a decade after all these guys were in art school together. And so Eric would tell me stories about Jim, and their other friends I met, David Elliott uh, was a good friend of Jim and Eric and Tom Livesay, they're here. But there's one story that I, I loved hearing about, and it was um, this group of art students, and I have a feeling it followed mucho glasses of beer, but they, they had this idea to reenact uh, the huge painting, Raft of the Medusa, on Town Lake, on Lady Bird Lake. <laughs> <laughs> so there was mucho conversation <laughs> about whatever craft, watercraft, they found on the lake. Uh, and the painting is in the Louvre. It's this machine of a painting. Um, and it's like 12 semi-nude men, and they're on a raft that's sinking, but in the, on the horizon line, you see a ship. So there's so much hope, you know, as they're hoping for the, the future of being saved. So this group of bozos <laughs> <laughs> go out on, on Town Lake on this raft, and of course the raft sank pretty, 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 cool. uh, pretty quickly, and there was a lot of uh, cursing and shouting and flailing about in the water, but I was thinking, oh, this wouldn't be what it would have been like to know them 10 years earlier, <laughs> as you did, for sure. Were you there? <laughs> nope, I was not. 
There were some all male adventures that, yeah, that well, we didn't always get a straight story on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I really love to hear the stories of, of the art school days. So, uh, so, but did, is there other things you all would like to say before we really do want to keep this moving? And um, well, if if you want to think about early. Uh, influences or that sort of thing. I can Let's think share of a them. little of that. I mean, I, I certainly think Russell Lee was a very important influence. And, mm -hmm. and Russell and Jean, Jean Lee were mentors to both of us for, right. for the rest of their lives. Um, but, you know, Bill Whitliffe made connections for Jim. Writers that were so generous like A.C. Green and Bill Porterfield made make connections for Jim. We first met A.C. Green when Jim and I were trespassing on Paisana. <laughs> we met A.C. at the, at the, at the, at the uh, low water crossing and he welcomed us and told us about the fellowship. And so we were very fortunate with those kind of connections. But Jim also uh, read deeply on nature you know, right. Lauren Isley, Betacek, um were were very important philosophical indeed yeah. influences. Well, and uh, influence as well. At one point, uh, Jim worked with um, the uh, great photographer Elliot Porter, and he was in Tusuki, yeah. New Mexico, and the, that was when he was working a lot with dye transfer. El Elliot so, was a mentor to Jim right. as well, and. We went out quite a few times and visited right. him, and then Jim became, uh, he became in charge of Elliot's dark room and did all the printing. And right. then the first, uh, first job that Elliot asked him to do was for his exhibition in the Metropolitan Museum of Art of Antarctica. Mm -hmm. Printing, you know, like a white on white. I mean, it's like <laughs> so uh, Jim, Jim proved to be an amazing printer right. and later did some teaching and workshops and dye transfer printing. He was really a master of that. I, yeah. Before I let this slip uh, out of my thinking, I want to remember and tell me that Bill and Sally Whitliffe were really important to you applying for a Pazano Fellowship and Anne received uh, a fellowship and she was the first woman to be. Yeah. Yeah be there. Uh, Jim was the first photographer and you yeah. were the first one. <laughs> so, yeah. so there, I, I just feel like I've, yeah. I've read I think, recent... I think Bill was president of the TIL that year. At least he's the one that called me and gave me the news. <laughs> really lovely. Yeah. yeah. It was, it, 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 it's life changing. Yeah, I, I really... I think, you know, that, that Jim's work is where it should be. I mean, there are so many early connections and, and crossovers. And I know I've read recently, you know, we used to, re, re, used to hear that we're six degrees of separation from each other. <laughs> but I've read recently it's four degrees mm -hmm. that we're even closer now. And um, I, lo I love that. To me, you know... Being close, it's, it's like making me feel secure and safe in the world. You know, I love that we're just four degrees separated. So, but in this room, in this room, you know, it's even closer. I think we're a whole lot closer. <laughs> so why don't we? Why don't we let Robert, of um, course, speak, and um, and then we're going to open this up to um, to the floor. So. And, Robert and I Bones. think Mary, Mary and I would take questions as well. Yeah, so we should be quiet. Because so. <laughs> am I registering here? <clears throat> yeah. So um, my family and I are, are really happy to be here and uh, wanted to thank everybody that made this event possible. I am the younger Bones <clears throat> of the two. Um, my brother and I, we're born, born almost exactly 13 years apart. It, that's pretty much a week away from that, so that's pretty exact. As adults, we had a running joke that our parents were blessed with not one, but two only children. <laughs> <laughs> it 
The earliest memories of my brother are from his teenage years at Vandenberg Air Force Base in the early 1960s. My brother was a maker of models. I recall a singular invitation into his inner sanctum, watching with fascination the meticulous construction of a radio-controlled model airplane by candlelight. <clears throat> the atmosphere was truly hypnotic, the spell suddenly broken with him wildly slapping at my forehead, our parents arriving home to the smell of burning hair and a scorched crew cut. <clears throat> that was mine, of course. <clears throat> my brother was also a patient observer, crouching in the California desert for countless hours with an old aluminum canteen and his wind-up eight millimeter movie camera, he recorded every missile launch possible from beginning to end. <clears throat> I remember a night leap, uh, I'm sorry, uh, yes, I remember a night leaping from my brother's lap and the gaze of his evil eye <laughs> in the terrifying black and white glow of the twilight zone. <clears throat> he used to scare the hell out of me. <clears throat> The windows rattling, the missile roaring, slowly rising from behind the backyard fence, then suddenly exploding into the most amazing fireworks display I think I will ever experience. I was five years old when my brother disappeared from our daily lives, having gone off to attend college at the University of Texas. A few years later, we moved to Austin where I rediscovered him among the contents of those mysterious Air Force footlockers stored in our garage. <clears throat> the airplane was there, among other boat and rocket models, along with several reels of movie film. As little brothers will sometimes do, I took possession. <laughs> when I edited the seemingly endless hours of launch footage down to a grocery bag of eight millimeter spaghetti, leaving only a single real compilation of the good parts, <laughs> he forgave me. <laughs> when I cannibalized the various parts of his meticulously crafted models to create something entirely new, he forgave me. As an adult, my brother continued to be a maker of models. He was the original Ikea, <laughs> crafting collapsible furniture in a plywood darkroom to suit his nomadic lifestyle. He also became a patient observer of the natural world, wandering the landscape, waiting for just the right conditions to capture the perfect imagers displayed here today. And I just thank everybody for being here and for putting it on. So, and thank I encourage you, everybody Robert. else to, you know, tell us some stories. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Could, could I add something to Robert's story? Yeah. Hey, Robert, didn't your brother also haul you out to those launches and put you into a foxhole that he had dug? <laughs> yep. Illegally. Illegally, yeah. So, yeah, so what happened was he... He would dig a foxhole uh, like next to a scrub brush and then he'd kind of burrow into it, right? And it was just him so he could get away with it. And I, I think he would, uh, he would throw a, a coat over him. You know, he probably had a you know, military coat and he'd throw over him and he would basically disappear. And uh, the day I was there, I think I was ready, wearing like a, a red, uh, <laughs> sweat, a bright red sweater or something. And the uh, surveillance helicopter started coming over and they kind of came over to us and started circling like buzzards. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, he, we got up and we ran to the car, but I think we were too slow and they got the license number. And um, so it didn't, it didn't end well, especially with little bro in tow, so. <laughs> <laughs> so who else, maybe someone on this side? Is there anyone who would like to Pick up from Harold. Robert. So I know it's hard. You can do yeah. it. Come on. Yeah. yeah, David. Hello, oh. I'm David Hollingsworth, and I met Jim and Ann 
in Capote Canyon over a Memorial Day Sierra Club outing, and I think it was probably 72. Uh, Capote Canyon uh, holds Capote Falls, the tallest waterfall in Texas. And uh, so we clicked immediately. Uh, I think I, uh, whenever y'all got out to Paisano, I came out there a few times. Yeah. And um, we started doing trips. Uh, I was working at Whole Earth Provision Company then, and uh, he became, both of y'all you know, were pretty well known around the store. Uh, I forget who the weaver was. Was that Andrea? It was into weaving at, at Whole Earth? And I'm not day. sure. I'm I forget sure, who it was, David. but there was some, we had lots of books on everything being, you know, take off of the Whole Earth uh, catalog. But anyway, Jim and I started doing lots of trips. Um, we did uh, one, uh, our first memorable trip was uh, three raft paddle trip to the lower canyons uh, with mostly people from Whole Earth and Jim's 90 pound box of camera supplies. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so which he carried up to the top of thousand foot tall Burrow Bluff and there's probably in one of these books there's a picture looking down into the rapids at the bottom of Burrow Bluff and I was standing right next to him petrified wow. because he had to <laughs> lean over the front of his camera which was right on the edge so he could adjust it. And uh, then we, of course, had a first of many flash floods that we in encountered on the trip. Um, there was, um, let's see, what else? There were lots of trips. Anyway, one of the uh, coinkadinkies about this whole thing is in 1980, Jim needed some pictures of Bokeas Canyon for one of his books. And it was uh, uh, September. And we went out just a single canoe and spent a whole week in Boquillas because I'd been doing guiding trips in there and knew all the trails and all the canyons. And as we left, there was a huge flash flood while we were on the river. And we barely made it to Adams Ranch, which was the takeout at the time. Had to wait a day for the water to go down. And we drove over to Terlingua because Jim said, Bill Whitliff's doing a, a Willie Nelson movie in Terlingua. <laughs> So we walk onto the site. I'm afraid we're going to you know, be accosted by the security guards. <laughs> and we walk up to Bill and Sally's uh, trailer, and they welcome Jim. And I realized that the person I knew as Mrs. Whitliff, the 10th grade geometry teacher, was that Sally Whitliff. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, anyway, we did lots of lots more trips. Uh, we did a, uh, the first and only, for both of us, ski camping in trip above Creed, Colorado in the middle of the winter to, uh, to get some pictures for one, another one of his books. And uh, so anyway, it just went on and on from there, but Thank we did you. lots and lots of stuff like that. Thank you. Somebody from this side? Harold. Yeah. Here, we need a microphone and, yes. and be sure and, and tell us your name. So I'm Harold Crawford. I've, uh, uh, perhaps it, except for his brother Robert, I've probably known Jim for longer than anybody in this room. We knew one another for 60 years. We met when we were 18 years old at the University of Texas. We both recognized pretty quickly that we were both service brats traveling around the country, and so uh, we uh, made a fast friendship. And uh, we, of course, shared things, but we also had a lot of things that were different about us, and we each sort of complemented the other over the years. We separated and came back together. And each time we came back together, it's like uh, our long conversation just kind of resumed where we had left it before, and we took up where we uh, had left off. I'll just uh, give you a little vignette uh, from our relationship and also a little story and then an observation for you. I remember the time when Jim was photographing at uh, at um, uh, Paisano, and uh, he liked to get out early in the morning when it was really cold. And one morning he got out and found a rattlesnake on a, on a rock. And the rattlesnake was out there patiently waiting for the sun to get high enough that it would warm the rattlesnake. And the rattlesnake was coiled up there, and so Jim went in really close and uh, photographed this rattlesnake. And then he reached out with his finger and stroked the rattlesnake on his snout. <laughs> the rattlesnake, of course, didn't move. He was too cold to move. But inside, he was probably going, yikes. <laughs> uh, 
uh, the other thing was that um, uh, Jim had, when he moved to Paisano, he had heard that uh, J. Frank Doby, whose ranch it was, had liked to sit out on the front porch and uh, drink whiskey and eat watermelon. <laughs> So, so uh, he arranged one of the first things that we did when he moved to Paisano, he invited us out there to sit on the porch and in honor of J. Frank Doby to uh, drink whiskey and, uh, and eat watermelon. Um, so a little story, uh, Jim always liked um, flowing water. You can see how many of his photographs have flowing water in them. And uh, partly this may have been what led him to uh, be, uh, his second career, where he was a river guide. He had to get an EMT certification for, to support this. He also had to get certified as a, uh, as a, a water rescue technician. And um, so then he was able to lead trips in the various uh, rivers of uh, New Mexico and, and the West. And there was a time when he was, uh, uh, he, uh, found out that the Chama River, which is normally uh, dammed up, was going to have a release of water. And it was a great uh, opportunity to take uh, some rafts out. So he arranged to get some rafts for us, and he called me up, and he invited myself. He invited my cousin, Alan, who's sitting right over there, Alan, hands up, and uh, Mark Mason. Mark, put your hand up. <laughs> anyway, Mark and Alan went with us, <clears throat> and we had a great time with Jim to guiding us down the river. The first night, we stopped at a, uh, a, a little uh, beach and a camp, and so Jim set up everything like he sets up for his clients and so forth, and like a good uh, guide, he began preparing the dinner for us, and he was preparing the dinner and we were kind of up there assisting with him, and all of a sudden, so he caught something out the corner of his eye, and he started running. He dropped all the utensils and started running for the river, loping with those big lopes, long legs of his, and he got down to the beach and made a mighty leap and landed in a boat that had broken loose and was beginning to drift out into the current. Uh, it would have been difficult to cope with if we'd lost one of our rafts with equipment in it and so forth. So he, got, he was able to get a hold of the paddles, was able to turn the boat around, we threw him a line and pulled him in, and then we were able to tie it up. Afterwards he was inspecting it to find out what, what had possibly happened, because he was always careful in tying up the, uh, uh, the rafts properly. And somebody had, had brought a dog with them, as one will, on a rafting trip. <laughs> and the dog had chewed through the painter that was holding the raft <laughs> and released it into the water. So that was how that happened. Um, so many beautiful um, uh, visions of the natural world in these images, is it not? Um, and I, uh, uh, I, Jim studied geology for, for some years. He kept an interest in geology and especially in evolution throughout his uh, uh, his, his life, and um, it's, it's uh, uh, not so remarkable to me that a man could make such lovely images of the natural world, so much as it is a miracle that the, uni that the natural world could make a man who could make such lovely images of the natural world. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Do you mind, you know? Can, can I interject? Go ahead. Yeah. So, I, thank you very much for bringing up the Burrow Bluff pour off. That, so, Jim's, um, a lot, uh, Jim's work is at the Museum of the Big Bend. They make up a lot of um, our backdrops for our big interpretive exhibits in our historic building. And that is one image that people are always drawn to, and they're like, where, did, where was it taken? And then it's like, you mean I can't get up there? And it's like, no, you can't, so knock it off. The second thing, <laughs> just stop it. The other thing I wanted to point out was really the impact of J. Frank Doby on Jim's life. He loved the Dobies. And um, he wrote a small book. He self-published it, Images, I think, of the Southwest, mm -hmm. and quoted Doby a lot. And I love, Harold, yeah. that you brought up the story of the bourbon and the watermelon, because I remember Jim had maybe every copy of the compilations that Doby had done, and I think it was the one on the Longhorns, where he and Tom Lee were going all around the state and kind of doing the history of Longhorn and cattle. And there's a passage where they get up in the morning 
and they eat warm watermelon and drink whiskey, <laughs> which is so cool. Um, but yeah, I, I'd say Paisano was a true turning point for him, and to have yeah. that year-long yeah. time there, it just... Uh, and to, and to be able to be in nature, and I agree 100% with when you were talking about water, I believe when Jim was truly his happiest was when he was on the river and he loved the Rio Grande and he loved doing those trips. There's a great photo I have of him at home where he's in a canoe and he's leaned back against all the equipment mm -hmm. and his hands are crossed and he just looks so happy and so content. And I think, really, being in nature and being affiliated with water, yeah, yeah that's where Jim was yeah. at his best. Yeah. You know, we um, promised you a short program, and I think we're going to say, hey, it's over. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>